What you're looking at here is a really spectacular reconstruction by someone named C. Walter Hodges. The globe is usually seen as a, as a circle, but in fact it was a, a very large polygon with 20 sections, three floors of seating, by the way, uh, hard wooden benches that you sat on. You could hire a cushion if you wanted. They faced a very large yard, and the stage, as you can see there on the right, projected out into this yard. In medieval drama, the performances of mystery plays, morality plays, that is Shakespeare's heritage, domestic heritage anyway, were often, quote, in the round. So people were used to performing uh, these stage plays uh, with an audience on at least three sides, which is what you had in these Elizabethan theaters as well. There was a stage, uh, again on the right there, uh, about five or six feet off of the yard. The yard was just earth, by the way, on the, on the ground there, uh, usually strewn with rushes, that is, the large uh, branches of trees. Uh, perhaps the stage had a railing around it, we don't know. Uh, and as you can see there, no, uh, letter L is the stage trap leading down to the hell. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but you had there um, a trap door to the underneath. The stage was covered over with a large canopy that protected the actors from rain. Actors only, by the way, no, not the spectators in the, in the yard. And the ceiling there is painted with uh, images of the heavens. This trapdoor that goes down to hell is usually, uh, well, it's, it's, it's referred to by, the, um, by Hamlet uh, when the ghost enters. Uh, it's probably used by the gravedigger. Hamlet calls the ghost Old Mole, uh, probably because he was down below the, the, what was seen to be the earth or the, the ground there, uh, the stage level. You had also these two large pillars uh, on either side of the stage, probably used for uh, characters to eavesdrop on one another, for example, or to uh, present themselves as trees if you were in a forest or what have you. But generally speaking, the staging was really very simple. Uh, the sets and the costumes were pretty simple. The language, therefore, as I said earlier, needed to be more descriptive, more elaborate, and that was because, as the chorus uh, to Henry V says, the, you had to, the audiences the, had to suspend their disbelief. It meant that actors needed to set the stage, not props, and that's why in As You Like It, for example, you have characters saying, so, this is the Forest of Arden perhaps with a gesture around to their surroundings, which look anything, uh, which don't look anything like a forest. Uh, or in Hamlet, there are moments where characters like Hamlet in, it has to say, the air bites shrewdly, it is very cold. And there are often these descriptions, and, and for a sunny summer afternoon where it may have been performed, even a chilly fall afternoon, it's not very cold in, in London. Uh, the, so, as the Henry V chorus says, you need to, quote, piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. The audience needs to go along and suspend its disbelief. Use the language to overpower their, their senses. The stage was, as you can see, large and rectangular, supported by these two big columns. Um, the stage may actually have been removable so that you could convert that yard into a bear baiting pit. The rear doors there on either side of the, um, the, the right pillar lead back to what's called the tiring house, which is where you changed costumes or attire, hence the name. This was both a backstage area and uh, an, an inner stage that could be opened up for discovery scenes. There was a curtain there, the letter N is on it. Um, a cave, for example, in Shakespeare's Tempest. A study uh, in Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, and so on. There was also the letter O there, you can see, a rear gallery above and behind the stage. This is where richer spectators could watch the, the play and, of course, be seen at the same time. Or musicians would sit. Or it was even a second stage when that was required. One of the sources of information that we have for Elizabethan theaters is stage directions. So in Romeo and Juliet, uh, balcony scene, for example, the stage direction says, enter Juliet above. 
So she's almost certainly up there in the in the rear gallery. Uh, in Richard II, we are told at one point that Richard enters on the castle walls and speaks down to people below. In uh, Thomas Kidd's Spanish tragedy, a character named Balthazar eavesdrops on other people, f- quote, from above, according to the stage direction. And indeed, actually, this, this balcony space was called for in stage directions in more than half of all the plays that are performed at the Globe uh, between 1599 and 1609, according to one study. Further above the uh, rear gallery is the hut, and this was that's its term. Uh, this was where there was machinery for stage effects. You would lower gods, for example. Uh, in Shakespeare's Cymbeline, um, the god Jupiter descends on an eagle, almost certainly from uh, from above, using a series of sort of winches and cables. This meant that the stage represented the entire cosmos, the heavens above, the earth in the middle, and hell down below. There were, surrounding this yard and the stage, spectators' galleries on three levels. DeWitt calls them the orchestra. That's a place where, in the ancient theaters, the Roman senators would sit. Uh, There were benches and a gallery uh, surrounding them. And this was really both a massive space and also a quite intimate space. No one, uh, no matter where they sat, was no more than 12 yards from center stage. And yet at one performance at the Rose, the numbers of people who were there were 2,200. And the capacity of the globe, which was even bigger, as I said, was 3,500. I'm going to show you now, uh, finally, the uh, an image of the modern globe. This was a um, this is a replica of Shakespeare's globe, which was opened in 1996, reconstructed from conjectural uh, images and at the best scholarship available, and so on 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 uh, building materials and design of of that theater. It is not actually on the site of the original theater. Uh, it's quite close to it, but uh, both of it, it's on the south bank of the Thames as well. This is a space where uh, Shakespeare's plays get staged, but also many plays by his contemporaries, many that you will not have heard of. Uh, but it's they, they are depicted or represented, I should say, in, in something that approximates their original conditions. You can see that the... Um, the sky is open above. Uh, you can see that people are sitting on hard benches, uh, and a lot of efforts have been made to replicate the original conditions of Shakespeare's theater. Of course, having helicopters go over in the middle of performances doesn't uh, make for authenticity. But anyway, the one major difference actually is that because of the, well, because of the disaster of Shakespeare's first globe, 1613, burning to the ground, uh, the thatched roof on this structure has a very good sprinkler system. Okay, now that you know all of this information about Shakespeare's theater, the discussion question for you is how does this knowledge of the theaters influence your reading of the plays that we've been reading?